Chapter 9. What about the Jews? Romans 3, 1 to 4, 9, 1 to uh, 11, 32. I'm just going to read the first portion. And uh, as to the three chapter from 9 to 11, I'm going to spare you. Okay. Romans 3, 1 to 4 said, uh, Then what advantage at the Jew? Or want is the benefit of a circumcision, great in every respect, first of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. Well then, but some did not believe their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be, rather let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. It is written, then thou, though that you may be justified in your words and the prevail when you are judged. If circumcision is without value to the Jew who break the law, and if a man is not the Jew, if it's only one outwardly, then it must be asked, what advantage is then either in being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? Apparently, there is no advantage in being a Jew, nor is the circumcision of any value. Paul does not fall into the trap of unnecessarily offending Jewish national sentiment, besides also banned theology. The entire Old Testament bears witness to the fact that the Jewish people and receive God's special favor. Their role as a people of God was intended to ensue and uh, ensue in responsible action rather than personal enjoyment. The fundamental problem of the Jew was that uh, he misunderstood the implications of being chosen by God. So instead of playing down the advantages of being a Jew, Paul responds to the question with a resounding much in every way. Then he starts listing the advantages. First of all, they have been trusted with the very words of God. The oracles or logial of God are the entrances of God. Paul referred, of course, to the Old Testament. The Jewish people were privileged to have been the nation to whom God had delivered his messages. There were the scribes who recorded and preserved what God has said done in secret history. Even if some of them had to be unfaithful, God would never break his covenant with Israel. God remained true, even though this would make every man a liar. God does not recant the favor which he had extended throughout history to his own people, the Jews. At this point, Paul is distracted from his line of argument. He set aside the question of how the gospel affects God's relationship to his own Old Testament people, while he takes care of several other important points that belong to his argument. In fact, Paul does not return to the question of the Jew until chapter 9. There in the Two fallen chapters, it discusses the issue at a considerable length. Our approach to this section will be to follow Paul's basic line of argument to comment on several points for special interest. It was a Israel, not God, that it failed. It's important to remember that the basic theme Romans nine to eleven is not the future of the Jewish race, but the character of God. Why has God, who first elected the Jews, not turned his attention to the Gentiles? Now, turn his attention to the Gentiles. What are we to understand in respect to his uh, age-long involvement with the people of Israel? As that special relationship come to an end, in that salvation is now extended to all who are accepted by faith, has God acted in the conspicuous, conspicuous and arbitrary fashion 
If so, what kind of a gun is he? The first sub subsection is nine one to five. He made the apostle laments over his kinsman by race. Paul could never forget the fact that he was a Jew. Although he had been commissioned an apostle to the Gentiles, he carried in his heart an unceasing anguish for his Jewish brethren. So profound was his sorrow for their spiritual condition that he would willingly be cut off from Christ if it would restore them to their intended position. Their blessings have been great beyond comparison. To them belong the rights of sonship, the glory of the divine presence, and the covenants between God and man. Furthermore, they receive instruction in the law, a guide to worship in the temple, and the promise of a divinely ordered destiny. They themselves are direct descendants of the patriarchs, whether the number and the fathers is. Human ancestry is concerned was none other than Christ, the Messiah. Blessed forevermore, be the God who is over all. Amen. In the only appropriate response of the spiritual sensitive heart. Words. Six to thirteen establishes the point that Israel's failure is her own. Her rejection of Christ does not mean that God has failed to keep His promise. God, He has not severed the tie with the true Israel. It should be clear that not every one who is descended from Israel is a true Israelite. Not every Israelite is a child of Abraham. Biblical history demonstrates that God's selective process has involved exclusion as well as inclusion. Ishmael was the son of Abraham and Hagar, the Egyptian maid servant. Also, he became the head of a great nation. He and his descendants were never counted among the people of God. Abraham's line of descent ran through Isaac, the son of promise. Although both Ishmael and Isaac were equally the natural children of Abraham, only the descendants of Isaac are children of the promise, and consequently Abraham's offering、uh, offspring. The same is true for Jacob the Esau, twin brother born to Isaac the Rebekah, even before they were born. Before either one had done anything good or bad. God chose Jacob, saying, "Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated." Nine thirteen, a Hebrew idiom indicating preference for one over the other. God's selection rests not on what a person has done, but upon His own sovereign will. Thus, the fact that Israel had failed does not mean that God has broken the promise. If the promise was made to the Israel. Within Israel, to choose one's human lineage does not make one a child of promise. Historically, God chosen on the basis of His own free will. But the question arises: Doesn't such a highly arbitrary procedure imply injustice on God's part? The first of two basic questions posed in verses fourteen to twenty-nine is: What、well, then shall we say? Is God unjust? The immediate response is not at all. Posing cites God's words to Moses. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Commentators stress the importance of these words for the proper understanding of the entire section. God's elective process not. Exercise for unqualified freedom, it reflects rather the freedom for His mercy. Whatever God does for man, He does out of mercy and compassion. As God owes no man anything, His selection sum does not make Him unjust to others. God's sovereignty is also seen in the raising up of a Pharaoh, that a dark prototype of all the rejected in Israel. And the Pharaoh's plans were overruled in accordance with God's purpose. So also will the plans for the disobedient Israel be brought to nothing. 
both the showing of mercy and the hardening of the heart, and expressions the divine will operating out of compassion for man. The second question arises immediately: If God doesn't what He wants, then why does He still blame us for who resist His will? If man is a pawn in God's hand, how can God blame him for what happens? If it is not morally wrong to assign responsibility for something over which a person has no control, no control, Paul's answer is straightforward and blunt: Who are you, O man, to talk bad to God? Can the pot say to the potter, "Why do you make me like this"? Doesn't the potter have the right to do what he wants to with the clay? Can he take one lump of clay and make from its vessel some for a noble and others for a menial purpose? Some writer have reacted strongly against Paul's argument. Dodd said that the analogy of man as a pot is the weakest point in the whole epistle. But what is the central point of the analogy? Is not that God rather than man is responsible for the outcome of history? The potter, not the pot, is responsible for what he produces. In calling both Jew and Gentiles into fellowship with Himself, it's God who bears the responsibility for the final outcome. Man has no cause to quibble. He forfeited everything by his sin. It is only by the mercy of God that.、Uh, Any are selected for divine favor. The inclusion of the Gentiles was foretold in prophetic scripture. Hosea said that those who are not God's people will be called the sons of the living God. And Isaiah prophesied that all those Israelites should in be numbered like the sand by the sea. Only the remnant will be saved. Thus, the Old Testament itself teaches that only some of the Jews will be saved. And then the Gentiles will become a part of the people of God. Whole Israel came to fail. What then is the conclusion? Is it not that the Gentiles who did not have the law's standard of righteousness as a guide, nevertheless obtained righteousness, but Israel pursued? A righteous based on law did not succeed in fulfilling that law. Gentiles living outside the law received righteousness, while Israel, trying to keep the law, failed. And why did Israel fail? Because their efforts were based on works, not on faith. The operating principle which leads to a right standing before God is the faith in what He has done. Not the confidence in our own ability to gain God's favor by meritorious actions. The gospel is God's proclamation that He has done all that is required. Man's responsibility is to accept it by faith. Israel stumbled over this obstacle. Her determination to establish her own righteousness made her blind to the righteousness which Christ offered as a free gift. Chapter Ten, clarifying and enlarges upon the theme of Israel's disobedience. Verse one to thirteen, contrasts righteousness based on law and the righteousness which results from faith. Verse fourteen to twenty-one demonstrates that Israel is without excuse for her failure. Paul has a deep concern for the salvation of his Jewish brethren. He knows from his own involvement in Judaism that they are zealous for God. Unfortunately, their zeal is not guided by true insight. Disregarding God's way to receive righteousness, they plunge the head in a vain attempt to establish their own. They did not realize that Christ is the end of the law. He is the end of the law, not only in a temporal sense, the struggle for righteousness by law is over, but also in the sense of his goal. He fulfills in himself the intention of the law. Since he is the end of the law, there is now righteousness for everyone who believes. In that, the demands of the law have been perfectly met in him. 
Righteousness is no longer a matter for human striving, but of a divine favor. But then something to say. Moses has something to say about、uh, law righteousness. Anyone who can perform it shall live by it. The obvious problem is that no one can carry out these demands. On the other hand, the righteousness based on faith that is unnecessary to scale be heaven, to scale heaven, and bring Christ down, or descend into the base to bring him back from the dead, because the message about the faith is already within reach. And what is that message? Simply this. If you openly confess Jesus the Lord and then believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you will be saved. When a person believes, he is justified in confessing this belief. His salvation is confirmed. The confession Jesus the Lord is the earliest creed of the Christian Church. Something that it rose during times of persecution in response to the empires. Insistence that her citizens acknowledge Caesar is the Lord. Its roots go deeper. However, the Greek word "kurios" serves both an expression of respect, sir, it has a normal title for emperors and gods. More importantly, for the early church, is the fact that "kurios" occurs more than six thousand times in the Greek Old Testament. And the name of God, Peter concludes his Pentecostal sermon with the declaration that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord, Kyrios, and Christ. That's Acts two thirty six. Cranfield writes the confession that Jesus the Lord met, the college, the acknowledgement that Jesus shared the name and the nature. The holiness, the authority, power, majesty, and eternity of the one and the only true God. It takes a faith to acknowledge Jesus as the Lord, and the open confession of this faith brings the salvation. Because righteousness comes by faith, matters not whether the believer is a Jew or Gentile. The same Lord blesses all who call on Him, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans ten thirteen. Now come to the excuses. You see that salvation results from calling on the name of the Lord. But how can anyone call on one in whom they have not believed? It doesn't believe him. Depends on hearing, and hearing on someone preaching. Furthermore, how can they preach unless they are sent? In short. Isn't Israel's failure due to never having heard, had a chance to hear? Oh no, says Paul. Isaiah describes the messengers who came bearing glad tidings, good things. You, that is in Isaiah fifty-two, seven. You can't claim that he never heard the message. You all heard it, but not everyone responded. As Isaiah said, "Lord, who has believed our message?" Isaiah fifty-three one. Of course, the Israelites heard the message. As the Psalm nineteen declares, "As it gone all over the earth, and reached men everywhere." See Romans ten eighteen. Also Psalm nineteen four. But what if Israel did not understand? Members' message was so difficult that Israel was unable to grasp its significance. Hardly, retorts Paul. Let me cite as a primary reference your own lawgiver Moses. He spoke for a nation void of understanding that would arouse your envy and anger. Romans ten nineteen. If that nation, which is no nation in God's sight, Understood the concept of righteousness by faith. How can you possibly argue that it's too difficult? As he put it even more boldly, he has God saying, "I have found by those not seeking me, I reveal myself to those who have not asked." 
verse twenty. If these Gentiles grant us a message, there is no excuse for the Jews. The real problem is that you are, as Isaiah also said, a disobedient and obstinate people. Isaiah fifty-five two. You miss the way of righteousness by faith, not because you never heard it, not because you couldn't understand it, but because you adamantly refused to accept it. In the self-willed and the fault-finding people, God's plan for the Jew. If the conclusion as far as that Israel is a willful and disobedient people, determined to pursue righteousness by a method bound to fail, then does not follow that for all practical purposes God had rejected His people. By no means, answers Paul. I myself am a Israelite. And God has not rejected me. Historically, there has always been a believing remnant. To remember when、uh, Elijah complained to God about the whole, all the prophet had been killed and he alone was left, and the enemies were trying to kill him. God said, "There are seven thousand who have the bow, the knee to bow." Paul,、uh, God has always preserved the remnant. As of old, so also at the present time, there remains a remnant chosen by grace. God has taken the initiative in preserving for Himself a person Israel. If a person were able to earn place in His remnant, then the privilege would no longer be based on the principle of an armory to favor. So this is a situation: Israel as a nation. In spite of their earnest seeking, did not find what they were looking for, a right standing before God. But the chosen remnant did. And what about the others? They became hardened. The word is a, a medical term that means to form a callous. To reject the truth is a spiritual suicide. Disobedience. Makes a person insensitive to the appeal of God. And the Old Testament says God has numbed their senses. He gave them blind eyes and deaf ears, and so it would still. David as well spoke their bondage and blindness. There is no question. But then the Jews have stumbled. The crucial issue is however. Are they permanently out of the race? Are they beyond recovery? Not at all," answers Paul. Now we come to the unfolding God's plan for the Jews. Because of their disobedience, salvation has come to the Gentiles. But watch what happens. This in turn would erode the evil of the Jews. This is saying, if the transgression of the Jews. Has enriched the Gentiles. How much greater will be the blessing of their full restoration? This fundamental insight is repeated and enlarged in the paragraph, which follows. Paul takes a pride in his ministry to the Gentiles, hoping that in this way, he can stir his countrymen to envy and bring some to salvation. If the rejection brought reconciliation to the world, then their acceptance must be considered a resurrection from the dead. Take hope. If the root is holy, so are the branches. That is, since Abraham and the patriarchs were consecrated to God, so also the whole nation set apart in a special way. Referring to the root and the branches leads Paul to expand his theme with related metaphor. That is in verse seventeen to twenty-four. Consider an olive tree whose natural branches have been broken off, so that the wild olive shoots might be grafted in. The domestic olive trees, Israel, is a natural branch of Jewish people, were broken off because of unbelief. You Gentiles, and the wild olive shoots that have been grafted in, and draw nourishment from the root, do not be arrogant. About the branches that have been cut off, 
Remember that it's a root that supports you, and that if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will He spare you. If you follow the course of action, consider both the kindness and the sternness of God, for He dealt in strict justice to those who disobeyed, but in kindness to you. It will continue the same way, of course, provided you remain responsive to that kindness. If not, you will be cut off as well. But note that if the two do not continue in their unbelief, God will grab them back into the tree. After all, it's easier to grab the natural branch than the wild one. We're right now at the conclusion of Paul's lengthy discussion. On God's plan for the Jew, he calls it a mystery. That is a truth which can be known only by revelation. Once hidden, but now disclosed to all who will hear. Paul shares the mystery with the believing Gentiles, so and they will remain humble, and not think too highly of themselves. The mystery has been handed, and in preceding verses, now it is clearly stated. It involves three stages in the fulfillment of the divine plan for salvation. The first part of God's plan is the hardening of the part of a part of Israel, not the partial hardening. That took place when the nation rejected God's way to attain righteousness. Secondly, this hardening will continue until the full complement of the Gentiles has come in. Has come in. Finally. As、so、all Israel will be saved, this is a crucial statement. Of the many interpretations which have been suggested, I found the following to be the most satisfactory, and so is an emphatic way of saying, in this way, and only in this way, all Israel refer to the nation Israel as a whole, but not necessarily to every individual. There's a point saying God's plan for the salvation of man involves three stages: one, the believing remnant; two, the Gentiles; three, Israel as a whole. Most standard commentaries on Romans hold that Paul is here teaching the salvation of Israel as eschatological event. Note that Paul says nothing about. Re-establishment of a national state for Israel to be saved, she will have to come by the way of faith. Paul saw God's favor to the Gentiles, prompting this movement of national repentance. He turns immediately to a scripture for confirmation: "The deliverer will come from Zion; he will turn godliness away from Jacob. They shall see the fulfillment of my covenant." When I take away their sins, Israel may be temporarily rejected by God for the benefit of the Gentiles, but from the standpoint of God' elective purpose, the Jewish people allowed by Him on account of the patriarchs. Remember, the gifts and call of God are irrevocable. You Gentiles were disobedient, but now enjoy God's mercy in the day of、uh, the disobedience. You have now. Become disobedient in order that they too may not receive mercy. What this amounts to is that God does bound all men over to disobedience, so that He may have mercy on them all. But the brand puts it: every man must be damned if he is to be justified. Paul's argument is now complete. Paul did not elect Israel and consequently bless her in many ways. Her insistence upon seeking righteousness by works led to a rejection of all, but the remnant. In terms of the Gentile, he not only fulfilled Old Testament promises, but also provided the motivation for Israel return. In the end, she will respond in faith that all Israel will be saved. The apostle closed the chapter verses thirty three thirty six with a. Rhapsody, rhapsody. I'm not on the word. Let's see, what is it? Learn it. Okay, rhapsody, rhapsody, rhapsody. 
absurdity that is、uh, recitation selection from epic poetry. Okay, good. With the rhapsody of praise, he confesses the depth of wisdom God, and the, the inscrutable nature of his actions. God is beyond the human king; no one has known his mind or given him advice. In him, all things find their origin, their impulse at the center, and their being. To him, be the glory forever. Amen. For discussion, the biblical scholar who understand Romans eleven twenty six in different way, they see this passage warned for the establishment of the modern state of Israel. The year nineteen forty six forty eight becomes a pivotal date in the fulfilling prophecy. Scientists said the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem and the animal sacrifice will be reinstated. Obviously, this view goes beyond the worst in question. But、uh, does the line of assault in chapter nine to eleven favor the interpretation? Would not reverting to a form of Old Testament sacrificial practice move away from the principle of faith and backward, back towards a righteous by works? How does eleven four with its insistence that Christ is the end of the law relate to this question? Do you recall why Paul shared this understanding? The future of the Jew, that is eleven twenty five.